Schwing, ring, kling, ein Saum. Ing, ring, schwing, ka e i la ring. Ha sa ka ha la ring, sa ka la ring. Sao ein kling, ring, schwing, aum. Namaste. Well, the other day I received a really excellent question from one of our viewers. And I'm not going to answer the question directly, but I'm going to give the background to the question, to the answer. And from that background, you will be able to understand the answer to the question very easily. So first we have to begin with the four levels of consciousness. Here's the good old chart. <laughs> Dvaita Vada is dualistic consciousness and the sadhana for that level is karma yoga, external ritualistic religious rules and regulations. And of course, that's exemplary of the jagra state of consciousness. Many, many objects. Huh? The next stage is Vishishtadvaita Vada. Vishishtadvaita means qualified non-duality. And this is the stage of Bhakti Yoga. And in Bhakti Yoga, the state of consciousness being investigated is Svapna, or dream consciousness. And basically the strategy of Bhakti Yoga is to give us a better dream, a perfect dream, than can come from our memories of the material world. And this elevates the consciousness and, and the emotions to the point where one feels whole and complete in relationship with God. So even though <laughs> the concept of God is kind of a device. Huh? It's not really true in the absolute sense, but you know, neither is anything else in the dualistic consciousness. So bhakti yoga, or the state of svapna, is a semi-dualistic consciousness with the knowledge that the actual reality is non-dual. So once a person acquires a sufficient stock of pious activities, good karma, subha karma, as the uh, Buddha would say, then he becomes eligible or actually spontaneously enters the stage of meditation. And in the stage of meditation, this is called vivartavada. Vivartavada means I know that the whole apparent material manifestation is actually illusory. And so as things come up, as the mind presents various dreams, I'm rejecting them. Neti, neti, not this, not that. It's the negative path. Up until this point, everything has been positive. There is a world, there is a right and wrong, there is a spiritual path, there are rules and regulations that allow you to commence this path and develop better states of consciousness and better karma. Okay, everything is in positive language, but when we get to the language of the uh, Vivartavada, it's all negative. And this is where the Buddha's situation comes into play. The Buddha's philosophy is via negativa, the negation of everything that seems to exist, but doesn't really exist. Everything that is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self is rejected until you're left with nothing, no thing, the void. And we made a video recently about the void and we also discussed this point in many of our older series about the Buddha's teaching, how the Vedic teaching is positivist. It even gives a positive name to the absolute, Brahman. 
But the Buddha's teaching is on a negative basis, via negativa. And that's why he rejects the idea of God, the idea of the soul, the idea of the existence of any objects, and so on, is to bring you to that point of total void. And then what happens? Well, it's hard to talk about. But we enter the final state of consciousness. From sushupti, which is the void, we come to turiya. Turiya simply means the fourth. And in this fourth state of consciousness, which is inexplicable, inconceivable, huh, is the self. So in other words, if we follow the course of meditation to its very conclusion, we automatically, spontaneously realize the self, or the, the nirvana, huh? nibbana or nirvana, nothingness, emptiness, extinction. Extinction of what? Extinction of illusion. And of course, that includes the rational self, huh? the empirical self, as it's called, the phenomenal self, the duality of observer and observed and observation. In other words, consciousness ceases and one is left with only pure awareness. Of course, the Buddha doesn't describe any of this. Because once you reach that stage, you discover it for yourself. There you are, all alone in the void with nothing. But there's still light. And where is the light coming from? And of course, you discover, by simple observation, it's coming from you. Who is aware of the void? Who is aware of the light? And so, the object becomes the subject, or the subject becomes the object, and all duality ceases to exist, and this is the highest state of consciousness. Ajatta. Ajatta means unborn, in which the world and duality and so on are non-existent. So, the Buddha was teaching this and many, many people were coming. Now, his principal disciples, and most of his disciples in general, came from Vedic society. And in Vedic society, of course, they're being trained in the via positiva. They had enough background in karma yoga and bhakti yoga to make the leap into the void and follow the Buddha to attain Nibbana or Nirvana. So in the first 500 years or so after the Buddha, many, many thousands of people attained Arhanthood or self-realization, enlightenment. And the Buddha's religion became very, very popular. Now, of course, as soon as you have a power center like a, a popular religion, there's going to be people who try to use it for their own gain. And there's also going to be people who are against it because it's taking away their power. So in India, you know, Buddha said, my teaching, my dispensation will last for a thousand years. But then when Sariputta came to him and begged him, you please ordain women also. He said, well, that means my dispensation is only going to last 500 years. Because the problem of mixing men and women will always remind one of the material existence, and it becomes harder and harder to get out. So after 500 years, we can take it from the word of the Buddha that by the time 2,000 years ago, his teaching was already corrupt. And what to speak of how corrupt it is today. But that's, I'll tell you, I'll get to that part of the story. So, of course, by that time, the Ashokan Empire 
had begun. And by the time a thousand years after the Buddha had elapsed, the Ashokan Empire was very firmly established all over India. Now, there were some people, of course, who used this to their advantage and they misused their power like in any religious power structure. But there were also powerful enemies, the Brahmins and the Muslims. The Muslims were increasingly interested in invading and colonizing India because it became so rich and so well developed under the Ashokan rule. So the people in power who were self-interested broke up the Ashokan Empire so that they could be kings on their own. And this opened up the Indian subcontinent to the invaders, the Muslim invaders from outside. And at some point, the Brahmins had got back enough power where they could have a counter-revolution against Buddhism with the support, military support, of the Muslim invaders. So about 1,200 years ago, uh, 12 to 1500 years ago. It's hard to be sure of the dates because a lot of this information has been suppressed. But anyway, after the breakup of the Ashokan Empire and the invasion of the Muslim rulers, there was a slaughter of Buddhists all over India. Of course, it was organized by the Brahmins. So there was a terrible slaughter Hundreds of millions died, or were killed, were murdered, actually, because Buddhists are nonviolent. They don't fight back. A lot of the Buddhists escaped to Tibet, to Bangladesh, to Myanmar, what is now Myanmar, and to Thailand and Sri Lanka. So those countries became overwhelmingly populated by Buddhists. Now, let's just go and look at Sri Lanka. Well, in Sri Lanka and Myanmar and Thailand, these things happened pretty much all at the same time. The local kings wanted independence from India. They had been like client states of the Ashokan Empire, but when that empire fell, and especially after the Muslim invasions, then they wanted to be independent and take care of themselves or actually form a coalition of Buddhist states outside of India and independent. The group of kings came up and said, okay, we want to be politically independent from India, economically independent from India, socially and also religiously independent. So we're going to declare ourselves to be a Buddhist monarchy. And okay, you monks, now you go back and rewrite the commentaries so that it's clear that Buddhism is a separate religion from Hinduism. I don't like that word Hinduism at all. <laughs> it actually comes from the Muslims, the Persians specifically. The Persians and the Sikhs were logger at loggerheads uh, and the dividing line was the river Indus. Right? So the Persians, with their accents, could not pronounce Indus. So it became Hindus. So they started then calling, ah, oh, those rascal Hindus. Right? So that's how the word got started. It's not present anywhere in the Vedas. This word Hindu is actually a, a pejorative term, a religious slur of an invading culture, a colonialistic culture that had nothing but contempt for the Vedas and everything they stood for. So it's really strange why contemporary Indians call themselves Hindus. But I know why it is, but it's something rather controversial that I really don't want to discuss here. So the Buddhists were slaughtered in India. They created independent Buddhist states. And then in Sri Lanka, for example, all the original commentaries on the Buddha suttas were burned. And this happened, you know, during the reign of these Buddhist kings who wanted independence. And then they 
supported the monks to write a whole new system of commentaries. They didn't touch the suttas too much. They edited them here and there. But they really completely destroyed the commentaries and replaced them with their own. And the, they're not very good. <laughs> they're really off. And we've done uh, a series based on Bhikkhu Nyanananda's work that discusses how they were off and why they were wrong and so on like that, called the Nibbana series. So you can look at that if you want to. But anyway, so Buddha's teaching was only confined to the Vivartivada level of Sushupti stage of consciousness. And it was the via negativa, not this, not that, neti neti. So of course, this looks very different from the overwhelmingly positivist uh, Vedic literature. So based on this distinction, they created a separate sectarian religion called Buddhism. What does it mean, Buddhist? Well, Buddha means the Buddha, and ism means something sort of like it. We say Jewish. You're sort of like a Jew. Jew, by the way, means God in Bengali. And there is still temples you can go to today called Gopal Jiu. Gopal Jiu Mandir means, you know, Krishna, the God, temple. So just like the Jew, Jewish people are sort of like Jew, Jew <laughs> So the Buddhist people are sort of like Buddha, but not really, because they had to invent this whole completely speculative thing to replace the layers of karma yoga and bhakti yoga that they inherited from the Vedic culture. I think this is one of the greatest tragedies in human history, that Buddhism divorced itself from the Vedic culture. They lost so much. I mean, most of Buddha's instructions are basically commentaries on the Upanishads. And if you know the Upanishads, that's perfectly obvious. He was speaking to people, mostly Brahmins and Kshatriyas, who had been trained in Vedas, Upanishads, Vedanta, and so on. So, you know, it's pretty obvious to one who knows the Vedas, but to one who doesn't know the Vedas, it's a great mystery. Huh? Now the temple is going off here. <laughs> that, that why Buddhism is so negative, huh? via negativa, and then they try to become like worshipers of the void, which makes absolutely no sense. How can you worship something that doesn't exist? They substituted Buddha for God. They worship Buddha. You go to any Buddhist temple today, they're doing pujas, just like in any temple, to a big image of Buddha. So what have they, what have they done? They've lost all their support from the Vedas. And so their religion became very weak. Their philosophy became very speculative, uh, very different from the Buddha's original philosophy. And of course, in Nepal and up in Tibet, the Buddhists there kept a lot of the Vedic symbolism. They just changed all the names. So they have tantric practices, you know, they have all kinds of gods and goddesses and demons and whatever, you know. And then there's many initiations and ceremonies that if you walk into them, knowing the Vedic ceremonies, it's just the same thing with different names, slightly different mantras and so on. They just change the dress and change the name and change the outward appearance a little bit. But it's the same thing. So, is just a difference of philosophy, a difference in outlook, a difference in process. 
whether you take the via positiva of the Vedas or the via negativa of the Buddha, you wind up in the same place. You just call it by a different name, that's all. But it's the very same thing. And this is the reason why uh, there's this tremendous divide today between the Vedic culture and the Buddhist culture, which is actually completely unnecessary. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum.